Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you guys had a good lunch break. Um, I'm going to start us off on Section GG Functional Abilities and Goals, and this will be done um, in partnership with my colleague, Anne, who will be joining us after the break. So as with all these presentations, you'll go ahead and see the acronyms that we're going to be using. Um, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with all of these, so I'll just kind of zip through these and start with our objectives. So um, the objectives for this section are to the artic articulate the section, uh, intent of Section GG, demonstrate a working knowledge of Section GG functional abilities and goals, explain the item definitions, and then apply coding instructions to accurately code practice scenarios and a case study. And so we will have an opportunity to use Slido quite a bit in this presentation. So I'd encourage you all to participate using Slido and um, uh, interacting with me as we go through the examples and the answers. Okay, so um, Terry mentioned earlier this morning about the Impact Act and Section GG uh, was created sort of also uh, with that in mind to meet the provisions of the Improving Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformation Act in 2014. Um, and it's been implemented across four post-acute care settings, including inpatient rehab facilities, skilled nursing facilities, long-term acute care hospitals, and home health agencies. And the number one goal for this, as you've heard, I think, repeatedly throughout several of the presentations, is to um, establish and increase alignment. So the intent of Section GG is to include items about functional abilities and goals focused on prior function, admission performance, discharge goals, and discharge performance. Residents in SNFs, as many of you are uh, aware of, have self-care and mobility limitations and are at risk for f further functional decline. So really there's uh, four items that we focus on with this. Um, GG0100, which is prior functioning and everyday activities, is assessed on admission. GG0110, which is prior device use, is also assessed on admission. And then GG0130 self-care and GG0170 mobility are assessed on admission and discharge. And this assesses the resident's need for, needs for assistance with self-care and mobility. Okay, so um, the SNF quality reporting program added four new quality measures that um, are listed here, or will be listed, excuse me, on the next slide, um, but they, the idea behind that is, again, meeting the requirements of the Impact Act, using data elements currently collected in the MDS Section GG, and adding and modifying data, data elements, including standardized data elements used across post-acute care settings, and they were adopted uh, for functional outcome measures previously endorsed by the National Quality Forum for uh, inpatient rehab facilities. Data collection for these measures began in October of last year. So here um, we have the uh, SNF QRP function measures. The first measure is an existing process measure and the four following one were the new outcome measures. So the SNF functional outcome um, measure, change in self-care for skilled uh, skilled nursing facility residents, SNF functional outcome measure for change in mobility score for skilled nursing facility residents, and then SNF functional outcome measure for discharge self-care self, self score for skilled nursing facility residents, and discharge mobility score for skilled nursing facility residents. So um, Part A, prospective payment system admission. This is the PPS assessment, which is A0310B. This is the first Medicare required assessment to be completed when the resident is admitted for a SNF Part A stay. This functional assessment must be completed within the first three days, and that is the first three calendar days of the Medicare Part A stay, starting with the date in A2400B, start of most recent Medicare stay, and the following two days ending at 11.59 p.m. on day three. So um, I know this was mentioned earlier, but this is gonna be uh, one of the new items, uh, and it's GG0135, which is interim performance. This is added to support PDPM's unscheduled PPS assessment, and it's not used for the SNF QRP, but is collected for the PDPM. When uh, completing the IPA, the assessment period or look back period reflects what the assessment period or look back period is for the items being completed. Section GG data, um, as I mentioned, is not used for the SNF QRP. Um, the IPA, 
doesn't include all of the Section GG items, just what's required for the PDPM. So you'll notice on the subsequent slides, the items that are listed, they're not the complete list of Section GG items. And they, uh, there have been several uh, additions of the word interim to the RAI manual to support this new assessment. So on this screen, you can see the GG0130 IPA assessment items. And the following, the coding is still the same, so you would use one of the six, um, uh, six codes or the activity not attempted code for the appropriate reason. And then following that, we have GG0170 um, interim performance assessment uh, items. Again, not all the items are used, just what's being used for the PDPM. So the Part A PPS discharge assessment is required to be completed when the resident's Medicare Part A stay ends, as documented in A2400C, end of most recent Medicare stay. And it's either as a standalone assessment when the resident's Medicare Part A stay ends, but the resident remains in the facility, or it may be combined with an Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1987 or the OBRA discharge if the Medicare Part A stay ends on the day of or one day before the resident's discharge date, which is A2000. These are some general coding tips. So the admission performance and discharge goals are coded on every admission assessment. So the start of the Part A PPS stay, regardless of length of stay and planned or unplanned discharge. If the resident does have an incomplete stay, we complete the admission performance and discharge goals. Discharge self-care and mobility performance items are not required in that situation. So how do we define incomplete stay? This is basically um, any emergency discharge. Um, so this is unplanned discharge as indicated by the type of discharge that has a discharge date, A2000, that is on the same day or the day after the end date of the most recent Medicare stay or discharge to an acute care, psychiatric, or long-term care hospital, indicated by A2100, equaling 3, 4, or 9, on an MDS discharge, A0310F, which is 10 or 11, that has a discharge date, A2000, that is on the same day or the day after the end of the most recent Medicare stay, A2400C, or the resident's death, A2100, equaling 8, as indicated on MDS tracking record, with uh, A0130F being 12, death in the facility that has a discharge date, A2000, that is on the same day or the day after the end of the most recent Medicare stay, or again, Medicare Part A uh, stays less than three days as indicated by the end of the most recent Medicare stay, minus the start of the most recent Medicare stays, less than three days. So in terms of sections, to uh, changes, excuse me, to section GG, um, one of the coding chips was revised to include uh, a new uh, item, so uh, GG0110C, we had mechanical lifts including sit-to-stands, uh, stand assist, and full body style lifts, and we added stair lifts to this as well. Um, continuing on with the changes, um, we uh, uh, clarified some of the steps for assessment, so um, step one now says incorporating, so we say self-care performance revised to include incorporating resident self-report. And we also added the statement for the interim payment assessment. The assessment period for section GG is the last three days, so the assessment reference date and the two days prior. We also clarified step number five, which now reads the admission functional assessment should be conducted prior to the resident benefiting from treatment interventions in order to reflect the resident's true admission baseline functional status. Another thing that we've added to Section GG is the performance coding. So contact guard was added to the definition of code 04 supervision or touching assistance in the resident assessment instrument manual. And we also added a decision tree. And this is a tool that guides the providers in coding the resident's performance on the assessment instrument. Um, and so we've said on when using the decision tree, um, you can use one of the six performance codes or the uh, activity not attempted codes. We do uh, recommend if you um, are using one of the activity not attempted codes, if the activity not occur, or only to use the activity not attempted codes, rather, if the activity did not occur, so the resident did not perform the activity and a helper did not perform the activity for that resident. So this is um, 
what the decision tree looks like. You also um, all should have it in your packet and for our online participants it is available for downloading as well. Um, I do strongly encourage use of this when we're doing some of the coding scenario um, examples that we're gonna do in just a little bit. It really does help kind of get to the right answer um, quickly and helps you sort of think about um, what sort of questions you should be answering. Um, another change to section GG is a coding tip for eating items. So we added a statement to address the coding of eating when a resident receives tube feedings or parenteral nutrition. Um, eating involves bringing food and liquids to the mouth and swallowing food. The administration of tube feedings and parenteral nutrition is not considered when coding this activity. The following is guidance for some situations in which a resident receives tube feedings or parenteral nutrition. So references to parenteral nutrition were added throughout coding tips for this item. Another change is in GG0170 coding tips for car transfers. So for item GG0170G, car transfer, we did say that use of an indoor car can be used to simulate outdoor car transfers. So these are half or full cars, and they would need to have similar features uh, the physical features of a real car for the purpose of simulating a car transfer. So it has to have a car seat with a car cabin. Um, and a car transfer item does not include transfers into the driver's seat. Uh, it's opening or closing the car door, fastening or unfastening the seat belt. The car transfer item solely includes the resident's ability to transfer in and out of the passenger seat of a car or a car simulator. So these are all tips that were clarified further. Okay, and uh, continuing on with GG0170G, in the event of inclement weather, or if an indoor car simulator or outdoor car is not available during the entire three-day assessment period, then we would use code 10, not attempted due to environmental limitations. And um, we've also made several edits to the examples to clarify and encourage providers to read through the RAI manual to see um, some of these changes. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna to go to is GG0100, prior functioning with everyday activities. Um, the item rationale here is knowledge of the resident's functioning prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury may inform treatment goals. So the first thing we do here is we complete it only at admission re-entry, admission entry, re-entry at the start of the SNF PPS day, which is the five-day PPS. And coding this is coded a little differently than the six uh, codes, um, we use three for independent, two for needed some help, one for dependent, eight for unknown, and nine for not applicable when we're coding the uh, prior functioning everyday activities. So there are four items to code here. GG0100A is self-care, and this is coding the patient's need for assistance with bathing, dressing, using the toilet, or eating prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. GG0100B is indoor mobility or ambulation, and it's coding the patient's need for assistance with walking from room to room with or without a device, such as a cane, crutch, or walker prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. GG0100C is stairs, so it's coding the patient's need for assistance with internal or external stairs with or without a device, such as a cane, crutch, or walker prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. And then finally in this section, we have GG0100D, which is functional cognition, coding the patient's needs for assistance with planning regular tasks such as shopping or remembering to take medication prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. So when coding these items, we have some steps listed here. Um, first thing to do is, of course, ask the resident or their family member about prior functioning with ADLs and then reviewing the resident's medical records for details describing the resident's prior functioning with everyday activities. Again, these are the coding instructions uh, for this section. So if the resident completed the activities by him or herself without, with or without an assistive device, with no assistance from a helper, they would be coded uh, three independent. If the resident needed partial assistance from another person to complete the activities, they would be coded two, needed some help. And if the helper completed the activities for the resident or the assistance of two or more helpers re was required for the resident to complete the activity, it would be coded one dependent. Sometimes it is unknown. So in this situation, if the resident's usual ability prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury is unknown, there is a code for this. It's code eight. And if the activity was not applicable to the resident prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury, then we would code nine not applicable. 
So if no information about the resident's ability is available after attempts to interview the resident or, or his or her family, and after reviewing the resident's medical record, um, code eight unknown. Next item in this section is GG0110 prior device use. Um, this item is actually used in the risk adjustment of the quality measures, and uh, the rationale is, of course, the knowledge of a uh, resident's routine use of devices and aids immediately prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury may, of course, inform the treatment goals. So prior device use, again, is completed only at admission, entry, re-entry, and at the start of the SNF PPS uh, stay, that's the five-day PPS. For this item, you would check all that apply. So. Um, we're actually going to have an opportunity to do that in just a minute. Um, the sepsis assessment, again, asking the resident or their family members about the resident's prior use or aid use, reviewing the resident's medical records, describing the resident's use of prior devices and aids. And then coding instructions, coding um, as many of these as apply. And if none of these apply, then checking Z, none of the above, if the resident did not use any of the listed devices or aids immediately prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. In GG0110C, mechanical lift, any device a resident or caregiver required for lifting or supporting the resident's body weight would be used here. And this uh, is a list of some of the examples, but it's not all inclusive. Um, so. Stair lift, Hoyer lift, bathtub lift, these are all examples that you could include on GG0110C. For GG0110D, walker, you would include all the walker types. Again, examples include but are not limited to pickup walkers, hemi walkers, rolling walkers, platform walkers, four wheel walkers, rollator walkers, knee walkers, or walkers for mobilizing while seated in a walker. All right, so now we're gonna watch a scenario um, of an assessing clinician answering GG0110. Uh, uh, Let's watch a scenario of an assessing clinician collecting information from multiple sources to code GG0110 prior device use. I noticed you have a few different devices here, Mr. Smith. Which of these were you using to help you walk just before you went to the hospital? I wasn't using anything. I was walking on my own. How's it going? Can I help answer anything? I was just asking your husband which of these devices he used to help him walk before going to the hospital. Oh, he was using that cane over there to help him get around. Oh, yeah, I guess I was using that. Okay, good. It also says here in your hospital discharge paperwork that you're using a walker before you were admitted. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I guess I used that when I went outside. Okay, and I see a wheelchair over there. Were you also using that? Uh, no, that's mine. I was using it when I had chemotherapy last year. Okay, thank you for clarifying. And were you using anything else like a shoe insert or a chairlift in another room, anything like that? No, that's all. Just what I told you. <laughs> Great, so this is an opportunity for us to use Slido. So how would you code GG0110 prior device use? Would it be check A, check A, manual wheelchair, B, check D, walker, C, check both A and D, or D, check Z, none of the above? So I'll give you guys just a few more minutes, get some more responses in there. And online participants, this is a great opportunity to get some answers in as well. All right, I think the odds are ever in the favor of B, so now we're gonna go ahead and check the correct answer. And it is B, check D, Walker. The rationale behind that is the clinician used multiple sources of information to determine that Mr. Smith was using a walker and a cane prior to his recent hospitalization. Prior use of a cane is not captured in GG0110, so only option D, Walker, should be checked. Collecting information from multiple sources ensures accuracy in coding. In this scenario, if the clinician did not use multiple sources, he may not have received enough information to make an accurate assessment of Mr. Smith's prior device use. So again, just encouraging, trying to get as many, um, in, trying to get information from as many sources as possible. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to GG0130 self-care and mobility. 
So the intent of both of these um, items is to identify the resident's ability for GG0130, it's um, the resident's ability to perform the listed self-care activities and discharge goals. And for GG0170, it's to identify the resident's ability to perform the listed mobility activities and discharge goals. So the steps for assessment, qualified licensed clinicians assess the resident's performance based on direct observation, reports from the patient or resident, clinicians, care staff, and or family. And the resident should be allowed to perform the activities as independently as possible as long as they're safe. If helper assistance is required because of a resident's performance being unsafe or of poor quality, we, would, uh, we uh, ask that providers score according to the amount and type of assistance provided. Activities may be completed with or without assistive devices, and use of assistive devices should not affect coding of the activity. Um, we tell providers that they need to refer to facility, federal, and state policies and procedures to determine which SNF staff members may complete an assessment and resident assessments are to be done in compliance with facility, federal, and state requirements. So the three-day assessment period, um, the admission assessment period is the first three days of the Part A stay, starting with the date in A2400B, start of the most recent Medicare stay, and the following two days, ending at 11.59 p.m. on day three. The discharge assessment period is the last three days of the Part A stay, starting with the date in A2400C, end of the most recent Medicare stay, and the two calendar days prior. So usual status. Um, an admission, this is the start of the SNF PPA stay, the resident's functional status should be based on a clinical assessment of the resident's performance that occurs soon after the resident's admission. The resident's functional assessment, when possible, should be conducted prior to the resident benefiting from treatment interventions in order to reflect the resident's true admission baseline functional status. With discharge, which is the end of the PPS day, code the resident's discharge functional status based on a clinical assessment of the resident's performance that occurs as close to the time of the resident's discharge from Medicare Part A as possible. So continuing with usual status, I know this is an item that we see a lot um, on help desk when we get questions. So a resident's functional status can be impacted by the environment or situations encountered at the facility. Observing the resident, resident's interactions with others in different locations and circumstances is important for a comprehensive understanding of the resident's functional status. If the resident's status varies, record the resident's usual ability to perform each activity. Do not record the resident's best and worst performance. Instead, record the resident's usual performance. So this is the six-point coding scale. Um, 06 is independent. 05, setup or cleanup assistance. 04, supervision or touching assistance. 03 is partial or moderate assistance. 02 is substantial or maximal assistance. And 01 is dependent. And this is what's used for GG0130 and GG0170. These are the activity not attempted codes. We've got four of them. Uh, code seven is resident refused. So if the resident refused to complete the activity, code nine is not applicable. So the, that's if the activity was not attempted and the resident did not perform this activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. Code 10, um, we discussed earlier with the car transfer too, but not attempted due to um, environmental limitations, for example, if there is a lack of equipment or any sort of weather constraints, such as snow. Code 88, not attempted due to medical conditions or safety concerns. And this is be that when the activity uh, was not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns. So if an activity was not attempted by a resident and a helper doesn't complete the activity for the resident, that's when um, one of these four activity att not attempted codes would be used. And this is for the entire three-day assessment period. So here we have a provider Q&A for code 10, not attempted due to environmental limitations. Um, this is a question that we've actually seen on our help desk. So can you provide scenarios in which a resident would be scored 10 for an item? And our answer is we do not expect code 10 not attempted to be used, not attempted due to environmental limitations to be used often. If a resident is unable to go outside due to inclement weather such as snow or cold temperatures and no indoor option for uneven surfaces available, code the activity GG0170L, walk 10 feet on uneven surfaces 
as 10 not attempted due to environmental limitations. Another example is for GG0170R, wheel 50 feet with two turns. If the resident is obese and you do not have a wheelchair that is the appropriate size for the resident, you would code 10, not attempted due to environmental limitations due to the lack of equipment. And um, we discussed the, the six point scale in greater detail and now we're gonna watch a video on the decision tree. We will walk through the decision tree for coding GG0130, self-care, and GG0170, Mobility, highlighting each coding level using an example of a patient, Mrs. Jones, completing GG0170D, sit to stand. The decision tree presents a series of yes-no questions, represented by diamonds, that guide you to the correct code for your patient or resident. Accurate coding is important to capture patient and resident safety, appropriate goal setting, and accurate evaluation of the patient's or resident's functional ability at discharge. The first question in the decision tree asks, does the patient or resident complete the activity, with or without assistive devices, by him or herself and with no assistance, including physical, verbal, or nonverbal cueing, setup, or cleanup? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 06 independent. Let's view an example of Mrs. Jones completing the sit to stand activity independently. In this scenario, Mrs. Jones is sitting up on the side of the bed. She retrieves her walker and places it in front of her. Then she safely rises to a standing position. Once standing, she holds on to the walker to steady herself. There is no assistance provided by a helper. If, however, the answer to this first question is no, the patient or resident is not able to complete the activity by him or herself without assistance, proceed to the next question. The second question in the decision tree asks, does the patient or resident need only setup or cleanup assistance from one helper? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 05, setup or cleanup assistance. Let's review an example of the same patient, Mrs. Jones, completing the sit to stand activity, but this time with setup or cleanup assistance. In this scenario, Mrs. Jones is sitting up on the side of the bed. She retrieves her walker and places it in front of her. Then, a helper raises the bed rail. Mrs. Jones grasps the bed rail and safely rises to a standing position. Once standing, she holds onto the walker to steady herself. In this example, the patient completes the activity by herself with setup assistance. Setup assistance is demonstrated by the helper raising the bed rail. So, you would code this 05, setup or cleanup assistance. If, however, the answer to this question is no, the patient or resident requires more than setup or cleanup assistance to complete the activity, proceed to the next question. The third question in the decision tree asks, does the patient or resident need only verbal or nonverbal cueing or steadying, touching, or contact guard assistance from one helper? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 04, supervision or touching assistance. Let's review an example of the same patient, Mrs. Jones, completing the sit-to-stand activity, but this time with supervision or touching assistance. In this scene, Mrs. Jones is sitting up on the side of the bed. She retrieves her walker and places it in front of her. Then, a helper raises the bed rail and provides cues for hand placement. I'm going to tell you how to do it safely. The helper also provides instructions to help Mrs. Jones safely rise to a standing position. Once standing, Mrs. Jones holds onto the walker to steady herself. In this scenario, Mrs. Jones needs verbal and nonverbal cueing from one helper, so you would use code 04, supervision or touching assistance. If, however, the answer to this question is no, the patient or resident requires more than supervision or touching assistance to complete the activity, proceed to the next question. The fourth question in the decision tree asks, does the patient or resident need physical assistance, for example, lifting or trunk support, from one helper with the helper providing less than half of the effort? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 03, 
partial, moderate assistance. Let's review an example of Mrs. Jones completing the sit-to-stand activity, but this time with partial, moderate assistance. In this scene, Mrs. Jones is sitting up on the side of the bed. She retrieves her walker and places it in front of her. Hey, Mrs. Jones. Oh, good morning. Okay. A helper raises the bed rail, secures a gate belt around her waist, and provides instructions regarding the transfer. One hand on the rail. You're going to put one on the hand on the bed. Mm -hmm. We're going to go on the count of three, all right? Then, while holding Mrs. Jones, the helper provides a slight upward boost using the gate belt. Mrs. Jones, who is bearing most of the weight, rises safely to a standing position. In this example, Mrs. Jones needs physical assistance with the helper providing less than half of the effort. So you would code this 03 partial moderate assistance. If, however, the answer to this question is no, the patient or resident requires more than partial moderate assistance to complete the activity, proceed to the next question. The fifth question in the decision tree asks, does the patient or resident need physical assistance, for example, lifting or trunk support from one helper, with the helper providing more than half of the effort? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 02 substantial maximal assistance. Let's review an example of the same patient, Mrs. Jones, completing the sit-to-stand activity, but this time with substantial maximal assistance. In this scene, Mrs. Jones is sitting up on the side of the bed. She retrieves her walker and places it in front of her. A helper raises the bed rail, secures a gate belt around Mrs. Jones' waist, and provides instruction regarding the transfer. We're gonna work together. Okay. Okay, on the count of three. Three. Okay. Using the gate belt, the helper lifts Mrs. Jones, bearing most of her weight during the transfer. One, two, two. three. The helper provides continual assistance as she moves Mrs. Jones to a standing position. In this scenario, Mrs. Jones needs physical assistance with the helper providing more than half of the effort, so you would code this 02 substantial maximal assistance. If, however, the answer to this question is no, the patient or resident requires more than substantial maximal assistance from one helper to complete the activity, proceed to the next question. The sixth and final question in the decision tree asks, does the helper provide all the effort to complete the activity, or is the assistance of two or more helpers required to complete the activity? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 01, dependent. Let's review a final example of the same patient, Mrs. Jones, completing the sit-to-stand activity, but this time the patient is dependent on two helpers to complete the activity. In this scene, two helpers are assisting Mrs. Jones. One helper secures a gate belt around Mrs. Jones' waist, while the other helper provides instructions about the transfer. On three, we're going to stand up. One, two, three, all the way up tall. Okay. Both helpers provide continual assistance as they move Mrs. Jones to a standing position, using the gate belt to fully support her weight. Once standing, Mrs. Jones holds onto the walker to steady herself. In this scenario, Mrs. Jones needs the physical assistance of two or more helpers to complete this activity, so you would code this 01 dependent. This video provided you with an overview of the decision tree for coding GG0130 self care and GG0170 mobility. We reviewed a series of key coding questions to help you identify the correct code for your patient or resident. Accurate coding is important to capture patient and resident safety appropriate goal setting, and accurate evaluation of the patient's or resident's functional ability at discharge. We hope you found this video helpful. For more information on coding section GG, refer to your setting-specific guidance manual that can be found on the CMS website. So again, to speak to, I know earlier before lunch, we had a presentation from Casey and that was really helpful and kind of guided you to the website. The website also has information on coding section GG, of course, as well. Um, so continuing on, we have some general coding tips for GG0130 and GG0170. Um, when observing the resident, reviewing the resident's medical record and interviewing the staff, be familiar with the definition of each activity. This helps answer sometimes a lot of the questions that are asked or the steps that are required for the activities. Do not record the staff's assessments 
of the resident's potential capability to perform the activity. Um, as clinicians, we always think, I think our patients sometimes can do a lot better, uh, but you know, we need to record what's actually happening. Um, and then to clarify your own understanding of the resident's performance of an activity, ask probing questions to staff about the resident beginning with the general and proceeding to the more specific, and there are examples of probing questions in the RAI manual as well. Again, um, we don't want to record the resident's best performance, and do not, we don't want to record the resident's worst performance, but rather record the resident's usual performance during the assessment period. If the resident does not attempt the activity and a helper does not complete the activity during the entire three-day assessment period, code the reason the activity was not attempted, and you'll be using the same six-point scale for recording usual performance and the resident's discharge goals, or one of the four activity not attempted codes to specify the reason why an activity was not attempted on both admission and discharge. Continuing with the general coding tips, documentation in the medical record is used to support the assessment of assessment coding of Section GG, and then data entered should be consistent with the clinical assessment documentation in the resident's medical record. Use of assistive devices to complete an activity should not affect the coding of the activity. So if a resident uses adaptive equipment and uses the device independently when performing an activity, you would code this resident 06 independent for this activity. And if the only help a resident needs to complete the activity is for an help, a helper to retrieve the assistive device or adaptive equipment, such as a cane for walking, then you would code the activity 05 setup or cleanup assistance. If two or more helpers are required to assist the resident in completing the activity, that should automatically tell you that the uh, code for that would be 01 dependent. So again, an, an opportunity to use Slido. Which example below best demonstrates allowing the resident to function as independently as possible? Your answer choices are A, feeding a resident who can feed himself in order to expedite mealtime. B, allowing the resident to brush her teeth as much as possible, assisting only if she becomes fatigued. C, providing the resident with a bedside commode when he is capable of walking to the bathroom with assistance. Or D, all of the above. So give you guys just a few more minutes to participate. Someone change their mind. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> Okay, and now we'll look at the correct answer. So the, uh, the example below that best, describe, best demonstrates allowing the resident to function as independently as possible is B, allowing the resident to brush her teeth as much as possible, assisting only if she becomes fatigued. And the rationale for that is it supports the resident's goal toward independence. Um, as an occupational therapist, I'm very pro-independent, so it allows her to participate in the activity to the fullest extent possible, only receiving assistance from the caregiver as needed. Residents should be allowed to perform activities as independently as possible as long as they are safe, and facility staff and or family should allow independence whenever possible to promote quality of life and a sense of well-being. So again, another opportunity for Slido. Since Mr. W uses a quad cane, he cannot be considered independent for the Section GG walking items. And this is a true or false question. So I'll give you guys a couple minutes to answer. Yeah, and uh, predominantly false. Let's look at the correct answer now. And it is false. The rationale for this is, of course, activities can be completed with or without an assistive device, and using the device does not should not affect coding of the activity. So use of the dash in GG0130 and GG0170. A dash indicates no information. CMS expects dash use to be a rare occurrence. Do not use a dash if the reason the activity was not observed was because one of the activity not attempted codes. So if the resident refused, the item was not applicable, the activity was not attempted due to environmental limitations, or the activity was not attempted due to a medical condition or safety concern. So that would not be a reason to use a dash. Use the six point scale or activity not attempted code to code the resident's discharge goals. Use of code 7, 9, 10, or 88 is permissible to code the discharge goals. For the SNF QRP, completion of at least one discharge goal is required for one of the self-care or mobility items for each resident. The use of, dash, of a DASH is permissible for any remaining self-care or mobility goals that were not coded. Using the DASH 
in this allowed instance does not affect the annual payment update or the APU determination. Licensed and qualified clinicians can establish a residence discharge goal at the time of admission. All right, so now we're gonna go into the GG0130 self-care admission performance for the three-day assessment period. Um, this is a screenshot of what you would see on the MDS. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. So the first item is GG0130A, eating. And the definition for this is the ability to use suitable utensils to bring food and or liquid to the mouth and swallow food and or liquid once the meal is placed before the resident. Uh, here we have some coding tips for GG0130A. So eating is assess assessing eating and drinking by mouth only. Uh, if a resident receives tube feedings or parenteral nutrition, assistance with tube feedings or parenteral nutrition is not considered when coding the item eating. If the resident does not eat or drink by mouth and relies solely on nutritional and liquids through tube feedings or parenteral nutrition because of a new, that's a recent onset medical condition, code GG0130A as 88 not attempted due to medical conditions or safety concerns. If the resident does not eat or drink by mouth at the time of the assessment and the resident did not eat or drink by mouth prior to the current illness, injury, or exacerbation, you'd code GG0130A09 not applicable. If the resident eats and drinks by mouth and relies partially on obtaining nutrition and liquids via tube feedings or parenteral nutrition, code eating based on the amount of assistance the resident requires to eat and drink by mouth. If the resident eats finger foods with his or her hands, code based on the amount and type of assistance provided. Okay, so we're gonna do a practice uh, coding scenario. This is with eating. So the dietary aide opens all of Mr. S's cartons and containers on his food tray before leaving the room. There are no safety concerns regarding Mr. S's ability to eat. Mr. S eats the food by himself excuse me, Mr. S eats the food himself, bringing the food to his mouth, using appropriate utensils and swallowing the food safely. How would you code GG0130A eating and what is your rationale? So again, we have an opportunity for Slido here. I'm gonna give you guys a chance to kind of use your decision trees maybe that are in your packets, ask those questions and come to the correct answer. I'm seeing a strong leaning here. Give you guys just a couple more minutes. Okay, and um, we can look at the correct answer now. So how would you code GG0130A? It would be 05 setup or cleanup assistance. And the rationale is the helper provided setup assistance prior to the eating activity, but Mr. S was eating um, by himself. So next we have oral hygiene. And the definition for this is the ability to use suitable items to clean teeth, dentures if applicable, the ability to insert and remove dentures into and from the mouth, and manage denture soaking and rinsing with the use of equipment. So here we have a video again for you guys to um, code. Here you see the helper providing studying assistance to Mr. Smith as he walks to the bathroom using his walker. Once in front of the bathroom sink, the helper applies toothpaste to Mr. Smith's toothbrush and leaves the room. Mr. Smith then brushes his teeth without supervision. Once Mr. Smith is done brushing his teeth, the helper re-engages by cleaning and putting away the oral hygiene items. The helper then provides steadying assistance to Mr. Smith as he walks back to bed. So let's look at the rationale for coding based on the video you just watched. So in this situation, coding uh, GG0130B oral hygiene would be coded 05 setup or cleanup assistance, and that's because the helper provided setup assistance by putting toothpaste on Mr. Smith's toothbrush and cleanup assistance by putting away his supplies after he completed the activity. Again, we're not considering the assistance pr provided going to and from the bathroom when coding oral hygiene. Okay, we have another video, and this time we're gonna review a second coding example um, of Mr. Smith's performance as he brushes his teeth, and we're gonna use Slido to practice the coding. Here you see the helper providing assistance to Mr. Smith as he walks to the bathroom. Once in front of the bathroom sink, the helper retrieves and puts toothpaste on Mr. Smith's toothbrush and hands it to him. The helper then steadies Mr. Smith's arm as he brushes his teeth. 
Once Mr. Smith has finished brushing his teeth, the helper rinses his toothbrush and puts it away. The helper then provides studying assistance as Mr. Smith walks back to bed. Okay, so how would you code GG0130B? Would it be A, 05, setup or cleanup? B, 04, supervision or touching assistance? C, 03, partial or moderate assistance? Or D, 02, substantial or maximal assistance? And it looks like lots of favorings, B. We're gonna look at the correct response now. And the answer is, O4, supervision or touching assistance. You guys are correct. You must be using your decision trees. <laughs> All right, so the rationale behind that is Mr. Smith required the helper to provide supervision and touching assistance in order to complete the activity of oral hygiene. And we do not consider assistance again provided to get to and from the bathroom when we're coding oral hygiene. Okay, so the next item, GG0130C, is toileting hygiene. And the definition for this is the ability to maintain perennial hygiene, adjust clothes before and after voiding or having a bowel movement. If managing an ostomy, include wiping the opening but not managing the equipment. Some tips for GG0130C toileting hygiene include managing undergarments, clothing, and incontinence products, and performing perennial cleansing before and after voiding or having a bowel movement. Toileting hygiene can take place before and after use of the toilet, commode, bedpan, or urinal. If the resident completes a bowel toileting program in bed, could toileting hygiene based on the resident's need for assistance in managing clothing and per per perennial cleansing, excuse me. If the resident does not use, usually use undergarments, which we have seen in some cases, then assess the resident's need for ass the assistance to manage lower body clothing and perennial hygiene. If a resident has an indwelling urinary catheter and has bowel movements, code the toileting hygiene item based on the amount of assistance needed by the resident when moving his or her bowels. All right, here's our example for toileting hygiene. So Mr. W uses a urinal when vo voiding without assistance with toileting hygiene tasks when sitting on the side of the bed. He uses a toilet with a raised toilet seat when moving his bowels and requires contact guard assistance from the helper as he holds onto a grab bar with one hand, lowers his underwear and pants, performs perianal peri hygiene, and pulls up his underwear and pants himself. So based on that information, how would you code GG0130C? And your options are A, O2, substantial or maximal assistance, O th B, O3, partial or moderate assistance, C, O4, supervision or touching assistance, or D, O6, independent. All right, a number of you have casted your votes, and let's look at the correct answer now. So it is C04 supervision or touching assistance. And the rationale behind that is the helper provides contact guard assistance as the resident completed the activity. So next we'll move to GG0130E, shower bathe self. And the definition for this is the ability to bathe self, including washing, rinsing, and drying self, but excluding washing of the back and hair. And it does not include transferring in and out of the tub or shower. Some coding tips for this item. Assessment can take place in a shower or bath, at a sink or at the bedside, so a sponge bath is fine. If the resident bathes himself or herself and a helper sets up materials for bathing or showering, then you would code this activity as 05 setup or cleanup assistance. If the resident cannot bathe his or her entire body because of a medical condition, then code shower bathe self based on the amount of assistance needed to complete the activity. So here's our practice coding scenario for GG0130E. Mr. J sits on a tub bench as he washes, rinses, and dries himself. A certified nursing assistant stays with him to ensure his safety as Mr. J has had instances of losing his sitting balance. The certified nursing assistant also provides lifting assistance as Mr. J gets onto and off of the tub bench. So how would you code GG0130E? Your answer choices are A, 04, supervision or touching assistance, B, O3, partial or moderate assistance, C, O2, substantial or maximal assistance, and D, O1, O1 dependent. All right. 
Seems to be some back and forth. Let's look at what the correct answer is. So the correct answer is actually a 04 supervision or touching assistance. And the rationale behind this is the helper provides supervision as Mr. J washes, rinses, and dries himself. Remember that transferring on and off the tub bench is not considered when coding this activity. All right, next we have GG0130F, upper body dressing. And this is the ability to dress and undress above the waist, including fasteners if applicable. So these are some examples of upper body dressing items. These are not the only examples, but these are the ones we typically see most often uh, questions asked about. So bra, undershirt, t-shirt, button down shirt, pullover shirt, sweatshirt, sweater, pajama top, TLSOs, abdominal binders, back brace, stump socks or shrinkers, upper body support devices, neck support or hand or arm prosthetic or orthotic. Here's our coding example for GG0130F, or a practice coding scenario, I should say, with upper body dressing. Mr. K sustained a spinal cord injury that has affected both movement and strength in both upper extremities. He places his left hand into one third of his left sleeve of his shirt with much time and effort and is unable to continue with the activity. A certified nursing assistant then completes the remaining upper body dressing for Mr. K. So how would you code GG0130F? Your answer choices are A, 04, supervision or touching assistance, B, 03, partial or moderate assistance, C, 02, substantial or maximal assistance, or D, 01, dependent. Seeing a lot of participation, a lot of answers towards C. Let's look at the correct answer now. And it is C, O2, substantial or maximal assistance. The rationale behind this um, example is that Mr. K places his left hand into one third of his left sleeve of his shirt, but can only perform a small portion of the activity of upper body dressing before he requires assistance by a helper who assists in completing this activity. The helper provides more than half of the effort for upper body dressing, which is why it's coded O2, substantial or maximal assistance. All right, so the next one we have is GG0130G, lower body dressing. This is the ability to dress and undress below the waist, including the fasteners, and does not include footwear. Here are some lower body dressing examples. Again, this is not an all-inclusive list. These are some examples that we see, and they are underwear, incontinence briefs, slacks, shorts, capri pants, pajama bottoms, skirts, knee braces, elastic bandages, stump socks or shrinkers, or lower limb prosthesis. Here's our uh, practice coding scenario for GG0130G, lower body dressing. Mrs. R has peripheral neur neuropathy in her upper and lower extremities. She needs assistance from a helper to place her lower limb into and take out of her lower limb prosthesis. And she needs no assistance to put on and remove her underwear or slacks. So based on this information, how would you code GG0130G? Your answer choices are A, O2, substantial or maximal assistance, B, O3, partial or moderate assistance, C, 04, supervision or touching assistance, and D, 06, independent. So I'll give you guys just a minute or two to go through this. Number of answers coming through. All right, let's look at what the right answer is. Be a lot of, lot of Bs. So how would you code GG0130G? The correct answer is B, 03, partial or moderate assistance. And the rationale behind this is the helper performs less than half of the effort for the task of lower body dressing with a prosthesis considered a piece of clothing. The last item in uh, self-care is GG0130H, putting on or taking off footwear. And the definition for this is the ability to put on and take off socks and shoes or other footwear that is appropriate for safe mobility, 
include fasteners if applicable. So here are some examples of footwear dressing items. We have socks, shoes, boots, running shoes, AFOs or ankle or foot arth orthosis, elastic bandages, foot orthotics, orthopedic walking boots, or compression stockings. So our uh, final practice coding scenario for self-care is Mr. M is undergoing rehabilitation for right side upper and lower body weakness following a stroke. He has made significant progress toward his independence and will be discharged home tomorrow. Mr. M wears an AFO that he puts on his foot and ankle after he puts his socks, but before he puts on his shoes. He always places his AFO socks and shoes within easy reach of his bed. While sitting on the bed, he needs to bend over to put on and take off his AFO socks and shoes, and he occasionally loses his sitting balance, requiring staff to place their hands on him to maintain his balance while performing the task. So based on that information, how would you code GG0130H? Your answer choices are A, 05, setup or cleanup assistance, B, 04, supervision or touching assistance, C, 03, partial or moderate assistance, or D, O2, substantial or maximal assistance. So it looks like we have a number of you voting for B, O4, supervision or touching assistance. Let's see if you all are correct. And you are. So the rationale behind this is Mr. M puts on and takes off his AFO socks and shoes by himself. However, because of occasional loss of balance, he needs a helper to provide touching assistance when he is bending over. So that concludes the GG0130 self-care uh, performance examples. Um, and now we're gonna go through the discharge goals. So for the discharge goal coding tips, you want to code the resident's discharge goals at the start of the SNF PPS stay, so that's the five-day PPS, using the six-point scale or one of the activity not attempted codes, so that's the 07, 09, 10, or 88. For the SNF QRP, a minimum of one self-care or mobility goal must be coded. However, facilities can choose to complete more than one. You'd enter a dash for any remaining self-care or mobility goals that were not coded. Using the dash in this allowed instance does not affect APU determination. So some continued um, discharge goal coding tips. Licensed or qualified clinicians can establish a resident's discharge goal at the time of admission based on their prior medical conditions, their prior and current self-care and mobility status, discussions with the resident and their family, professional judgment and standards of practice, expected treatments, residents' motivation to improve, anticipated length of stay, and discharge or setting home. Discharge setting or what their home is like. So goals should be established as part of the resident's care plan. Discharge goals may be coded the same as five-day PPS admission performance, higher than the admission performance, or lower than the admission performance, and reflect maintenance, improvement, or decline in function, respectively. If the admission performance of an activity was coded using one of the activity not attempted codes, so that's 07, 09, 10, or 88, a discharge goal may be coded using the six-point scale if the resident is expected to be able to perform the activity by discharge. And now we have GG0170 mobility, functional ability, and goals. So similar to what we went through for self-care, I'll probably start us off with this, and then um, we'll go to the break following that, because I, I finished a lot earlier than I think we, we thought I would, so. So again, we have a three-day assessment period for GG0170 mobility as assessment, admission performances. And these are all the items that we'll test on that. So I'm gonna start us off and then Anne will come in and um, continue where I leave off. So first thing we have is GG0170A through GG0170D and these are bed mobility items. 
So we have some coding tips for items GG0170A through C. And if the clinician determines that bed mobility cannot be assessed because of the degree to which the head of the bed must be elevated because of a medical condition, then code the activities GG0170A, roll left and right, GG0170B, sit to lying, and GG0170C, lying to sitting on side of the bed as 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. For GG0170A through C, clinical judgment should be used to determine what is considered a lying position for the resident. For example, a clinician could determine that a resident's slightly elevated resting position is lying for that particular resident. So first item we have is GG0170A, roll left and right. The definition of that is the ability to roll from lying on the back to left, to left and right side and returning to lying on back on the bed. So here's our practice coding scenario for uh, GG0170A, roll left and right. Miss W's head of bed must remain slightly elevated at all times due to aspiration precautions. Although the head of the bed is slightly elevated, the therapist uses clinical judgment and determines she can assess Miss W's abil ability to roll left and right. The therapist provides verbal instructions as Miss W completes the activity. So, again, bringing out Slido, how would you code GG0170A? Your options are A, 05, set up or clean up assistance, B, 04, supervision and touching assistance, C, 09, not applicable, or D, 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns. So I'll give you guys a chance to answer this. Looks like a number of you are leaning towards B. We'll go ahead and look at the correct answer now. And the correct answer is in fact B, code 04, supervision and touching assistance. The rationale behind this being, Ms. W requires verbal instructions while rolling left and right in the bed, and the assessment definition includes lying on back. In this example, the clinician uses clinical judgment and determines the assessment can be conducted with the head of the bed slightly elevated. All right, our next one uh, is GG0170B, sit to lying, and the definition of this item is the ability to move from sitting on side of the bed to lying flat on the bed. And here's our practice coding scenario for GG0170B, sit to lying. Mr. P has peripheral vascular disease and recently had a right above the knee amputation. Mr. P requires the physical therapist to provide steadying assistance due to his poor balance as he moves from a sitting position to lying down. How would you code GG0170B? Again, Slido opportunity. Your answer choices are A, 05, set up or clean up assistance, B, 04, supervision or touching assistance, C, 03, partial or moderate assistance, or D09 not applicable. Number of you voting for B. Let's go ahead and take a look at what the correct answer is. And it is in fact 04 supervision or touching assistance. The rationale being the helper provided only steadying assistance as Mr. P performed the activity. The bed mobility items should be assessed on a bed, not on a raised mat. This includes GG0170A, roll left and right, GG0170B, sit to lying, and GG0170C, lying to sitting on the side of the bed. We've seen a number of help desk questions asking about that, so that's why we like to just give that tip and um, remind you guys that these have to be assessed in a bed, or on a bed. Okay, next we have GG0170C, lying to sitting on the side of the bed. And this is the ability to move from lying on the back to sitting on the side of the bed with feet flat on the floor and with no back support. So here are some coding tips for GG0170C. If a resident's feet do not reach the floor upon lying to sitting, the clinician will determine if a bed height adjustment or footstool is required to accommodate foot placement on the floor or footstool. Back support refers to an object or person providing support of the resident's back. And here's a video on um, coding GG0170C. Hi, Mrs. Brown, how are you today? I'm doing a little better, thanks. Good. 
Can you come sit on the side of the bed for me? It's hard, but I'll try. Oh, could you help with my legs? Of course. Good job. Thank you. All right, so now we'll um, look at the rationale for that video. So it would you would code GG0170C03 partial and moderate assistance. And the rationale is that Mrs. Brown began to move to a seated position. As she began to move to a seated position, the clinician assisted with pivoting Mrs. Brown legs, Mrs. Brown's legs to the side of the bed. The clinician provided assistance that represents less than half of the effort to complete the activity. So we'll do one more video. Hi, Mrs. Brown. How are you today? I'm doing a little better, thanks. Good. Can you come sit on the side of the bed for me? It's hard, but I'll try. Looks like you're struggling a bit. Can I help you? Yes, thanks. OK, first, let me have you try to lie on your side. Great. Now, put your hand on the bed and push yourself up. As you do that, I'm going to put my hand on your upper back and arm and swing your legs until you're in a seated position. Is that okay? Sure. Let's give it a try. Good job. Thanks. Okay. So how would you code GG0170C? Your answer choices are A, 04, supervision or touching assistance, B, 03, mar partial or moderate assistance, C, 02, substantial or maximal assistance, or D, 01, dependent. Several of you still submitting your codes for that. We'll go ahead and look at the right answer. And it is C, O2, substantial or maximal assistance. So I think we're going to take a break. We're going to end a little earlier, but I don't, I've never heard anybody complaining ending a session earlier to take a longer break. So I'll turn it back over to Bridget. So my name is Anne, and I will be picking up where Manisha left off. And just as a reminder, in your packets, you do have a copy of the decision tree if you want to look at that as we're going through the case. Um, scenarios and also you have the examples also in your packet if you want to be able to have that in front of you as you uh, are reviewing them and thinking about the coding. Okay, so the next set of items, uh, GG0130 or 170D uh, through G are the transfer items. Uh, so we're actually uh, going to get started actually with the sit to stand. Uh, sit to stand return, refers to the ability to come to a standing position from sitting in a chair, wheelchair, or on the side of the bed. We do have a practice scenario for you here, number 13. So Ms. R has severe rheumatoid arthritis and uses forearm crutches to ambulate. The certified nursing assistant brings Ms. R her crutches and helps her to stand at the side of the bed. The certified nursing assistants provide some lifting assistance to get Ms. R to a standing position, but provides less than half of the effort to complete the activity. And just to kind of help you understand how to apply the decision tree, um, if you pull that out, basically the first question in the decision tree basically asks whether an a helper was needed and so obviously in this scenario the answer is yes so then the next question is whether there's just uh, set up assistance being provided by one helper and the answer is no there's more assistance provided so then you'd say um, as you're going through the decision tree is there just uh, cueing or setting or touching assistance being provided to the patient to the resident if it's more than that then you would have a lower score um, and so then you'd say, does the um, resident perform more than half of the effort? So the helper is providing less than half of the effort. If the answer to that is yes, then you would code three. If the answer is uh, no, that the helper is providing more than half of the effort, then the code would be a two. So in this particular scenario, um, it says Ms. R uh, comes to a standing uh, 
position. There is definitely some lifting assistance being provided, and uh, it says the uh, helper, let's see, uh, to get the certified nursing assistance provides less than half of the effort to complete the activity. So if you could pull out Slido and start thinking about what the correct response would be, the options are A, O3, partial moderate assistance, to substantial maximal assistance, code one dependent, or code 88 not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. So it looks like a fair number of people are coding three. Um, looks like a couple of people coding two. So again, uh, more than half of the effort being uh, the helper uh, providing uh, more than half of the effort would be a two. If the patient is putting in more than half of the effort, it would be a level three. So we'll go ahead and see what the correct response is. And so um, as you can see, the correct response is indeed O3, which most of you did code. And the rationale here is that, again, the helper was providing lifting assistance, so it's more than just touching assistance, but it was less than half of the effort. The next activity is very similar. Um, in this case, we're looking at chair, bed to chair transfer. This is defined as the ability to transfer to and from a bed, chair, or wheelchair. Um, this can be done many different ways. So for an individual, it may be a stand and a pivot, uh, sitting into a chair. For other uh, persons, it may be perhaps uh, using a transfer board, getting from a bed into a wheelchair or a bed into a chair. And so whatever the person is doing in terms of the actual transfer can vary. And again, it's code based on the type and amount of assistance required to complete the activity. Um, we've had several uh, questions on the help desk over the years ac across um, all of the uh, settings who are coding the GG items, and so we do have some coding tips that we've put together that are in the manual and on the slides to help you uh, to code consistently. So the activities of sit to lying and lying to sitting on side of the bed are two separate activities that are assessed as part of GG 0170E. If a mechanical lift is used to assist in transferring a resident from for a chair bed chair transfer and two helpers are needed to assist with the mechanical lift transfer then code 01 dependent even if the resident assists with any part of the chair bed chair transfer so this is actually a common question that we've had um, if you have two helpers helping with one activity for a resident, would that always be coded one? And the answer is yes. And in fact, I will walk you through the decision tree to help you understand how the decision tree could help you come to that um, rationale. And the reason that we get this question, by the way, is as Manisha explained the rating scale, um, if the the resident contributes a little bit of effort towards completing an activity, we say code level two, but in the instance that two helpers are required, there, that's a significant amount of assistance, and so that actually then uh, is coded 01, and the person doesn't get basically the credit uh, in that case for performing part of a little bit of the activity um, in, as in the case where there was only one helper. So again, if the patient is contributing a bit of effort to completing the activity and one helper is assisting, that would be coded two. If two helpers are required and the patient, the resident contributes a little bit of effort, the code would be level one. And if you look at the decision tree, one of the things that you'll notice is that at each of the levels, as you're trying to determine or answer the question, we have that only one helper is providing setup assistance or touching assistance or more than half the effort or less than half of the effort. So if you're always answering that two people, two or more people are providing assistance, you're going to get to the level one dependent. So I hope, hope that makes sense. So that's, again, an application of the decision tree to help you use that. Okay, so we do have another practice scenario here. So Mr. Yu had his left lower uh, leg amputated because of gangrene associated with diabetes, and he has reduced sensation and strength in his right leg. 
He has not yet received his below-the-knee prosthesis. Mr. Yu uses a transfer board for bed chair wheelchair transfers. The therapist places the transfer board under his buttock. Uh, Mr. W then uh, attempts to scoot from the bed onto the transfer board, but again, he has reduced sensation in his hands and limited upper body strength, and so the physical therapist assists him in side scooting by lifting his trunk in a rocking motion as Mr. Yu scoots across the transfer board and into the wheelchair. There's a lot of things going on here, so we do provide some overall guidance that overall the therapist provides more than half of the effort. So if the description wasn't very clear, you can go through the decision tree, and it says here that the therapist provides more than half of the effort. So I will let you think, excuse me, I will let you think through how to code that, but basically, obviously, more than touching assistance, um, there's some lifting assistance being involved here. If the uh, helper is providing less than half of the effort, that would be a three. If the helper is providing more than half of the effort, that would be a level two. So if you could pull out Slido, uh, the code options for you to um, provide as a response are number four, supervision touching assistance, three, partial moderate assistance, two, substantial maximal assistance, and code one would be dependent. Looks like uh, quite a few people have already responded. There seems to be a favorite response so far. Looks like there's still some more responses coming in, so I'll just wait a second here. Okay, still some responses coming in. All right, slowing down a little bit. Okay, so it looks like uh, most of you coded level two, and uh, let's see what the correct response is. And it does look like most of you were correct. Excellent. Okay, and so as probably you figured out in terms of rationale, in this case, the helper was providing more effort than the patient, the resident, and therefore the uh, code was uh, level two. Okay, the next activity is toilet transfer, and this is simply getting on and off the toilet. Um, again, based on help desk questions and prior training questions that you have provided, uh, we wanted to share some coding tips that are both on the slides and in the, the uh, RAI manual. Uh, so basically, do not in, uh, consider or include uh, toileting hygiene item tasks which uh, when you're coding the toilet transfer. So obviously when somebody is actually going to the bathroom using a toilet or a commode, they will be managing clothing, doing cleansing, and managing clothing again. But in this instance, you have to kind of separate those out in your mind. And so the issue with toilet transfer is basically getting on and off a toilet. Could be a regular toilet, could be a raised toilet seat. Um, as Manisha said, uh, you, you don't have a scoring difference. The code doesn't go up or down based on use of assistive device. It's all about the type and amount of assistance required to complete the activity of getting on and off a toilet. Um, transferring on and off a bedpan doesn't count, uh, but as I said, getting on and off a commode is, is uh, an acceptable way to assess this activity. So here we have another scenario for you. Um, this is Mrs. M. She had a total hip replacement following a hip fracture and was in an acute care hospital prior to being transferred to a skilled nursing facility. While in the acute, acute care hospital, she was using, starting to use a raised toilet seat. When Ms. M needs to void, the certified nursing assistants provide steadying assistance as Ms. M transfers safely from the wheelchair to the raised toilet seat. How would you code uh, Miss M. So would you say that she requires setup or cleanup assistance, that she requires uh, supervision or touching assistance, 04, she requires substantial or maximal assistance, 02, or would this code be 9, not applicable? I will give you a few moments to make a decision on that coding. Okay, it looks like it's slowing down. So let's see what the correct response is. OK. 
Okay. And you are indeed correct. Many of you coded 04 supervision or touching assistance. So the rationale, of course, is that the certified nursing assistants provided only touching assistance during the activity. The raised toilet seat is used during the initial assessment, the admission assessment, and was previously used in the acute care hospital. Activities may be scored with or without assistive devices, whatever is appropriate for that individual. So next we're moving on to car transfers. So car transfers refers to the ability to get into and out of a car or van on the passenger side. It does not include the ability to open or close door or fasten seat belts. So it's a pretty limited uh, part of getting in and out of a car. And again, it's on the passenger side. Um, I know over time we've had a fair number of help desk questions about whether there can be simulators used for this. And so you would use your clinical judgment if you do have some um, type of you know, partial vehicle um, or some other type of uh, setup that basically simulates this activity of getting in and out of a car passenger seat. And if you can do that, then absolutely you can, do, can uh, use that as your assessment. Obviously, if um, family are coming in and the person's uh, car that they'll actually be using post-discharge, and you can practice with that, especially close to discharge, that is, of course, great also. Um, but it doesn't have to be if that's not available. So use of an indoor car can be used to simulate outdoor car transfers. These half or full cars would need to have similar features of a real car, so a car seat within a car cabin. Car transfers that uh, do not include transfers, uh, car transfer does not include transfers into the driver's seat. Um, again, not, does not include opening or closing the door or fastening or unfastening seat belts. In the event of inclement weather, um, let's say if you were going to go outside and there's inclement weather and you do not have access to an indoor car, there uh, for the entire, let's say, last three days of the sniff stay for the resident, uh, you certainly may be coding 10 um, activity not attempted due to environmental limitations. This is one of the activities that that category actually does make sense. In general, we don't expect to see the 10 uh, activity not attempted due to environmental limitations be used for many items, but this is absolutely one that it makes sense. So we do have a practice scenario here. So during uh, her rehabilitation stay, Ms. N works uh, with an occupational therapist on transfers in and out of the passenger side of the car. On the day before discharge, when performing car transfers, Ms. N requires verbal reminders for safety and light touching assistance. The therapist instructs her on strategic hand placement while Ms. N transitions from sitting into the passenger seat the therapist open and closes the door. So there is a bit of distractor in that last sentence. So as I've said, that's actually not considered when you're thinking about overall effort. So what you would be paying attention to here is that the um, occupational therapist is providing verbal reminders for safety and also light touching assistance. There's um, instruction, so that's the verbal reminders. Um, about hand placement. So as you're thinking through the decision tree, there is help being provided. It's more than setup or cleanup assistance. Um, and so then the next level down would be if it's just uh, supervision, touching assistance, contact guard assistance, that level of assistance. And if there's no lifting assistance, then that's basically where you would stop in the decision tree. So let's see what you think about the coding for this particular example. Um, the options are five, set up cleanup assistance, four, supervision or touching assistance, two, substantial or maximal assistance, and one, dependent. So it looks like a fair number of people have uh, responded already. I'll give you another few seconds. Okay, looks like it's slowing down, so we will 
go ahead and see if uh, the correct answer is what most of you coded, and indeed it is, uh, level four. And again, the rationale here is that there was both verbal uh, assistance and touching assistance. Either one or both of them together would be coded level four. Um, again, the assistance with opening and closing the door is not included when you're thinking about effort related to this activity, um, so I hope you weren't distracted by that. So the next few items relate to walking, and so uh, we will go through each of those items individually, and again, we have some uh, examples and some coding tips. Um, so the first coding tips related to all of the walking items. Um, walking items do not need to occur during one session. So we have different distances, for example, 10 feet. We have um, walking on uneven surfaces. We have 50 feet with two turns, 150 feet. So sometimes we get questions about whether that needs to all happen within one therapy session, for example, or one day. And no, use your clinical judgment to determine uh, when it's safe and appropriate to be able to uh, do the assessment of these activities. Um, we certainly you know, want the, the resident to be able to perform the activity as independently as possible. Okay, so the next coding tip, a resident may take a brief standing break, or we call it a breather, uh, while walking. Uh, you would be using your clinical judgment about what a breather is. Um, so a brief stop is acceptable. If somebody, for example, with the 150 feet, the longer distances uh, needs to sit down in the middle of walking, that would not be considered 150 feet uh, a distance being accomplished. When coding uh, GG0170 walking items, do not consider the uh, resident's mobility performance when using parallel bars. The rationale for that is that parallel bars are not portable, so the person would not be able to walk in the hallway uh, if it's 5 feet or 10 feet or 15 feet with those parallel bars because those are not portable. So that's why the parallel bars don't count. Parallel bars, um, as I said, are not portable. Um, if safe, assess and code the patient using portable walking devices such as a cane, walker, or um, uh, any other type of uh, de walking uh, mobility device. If the resident cannot walk without the use of parallel bars due to his or her medical condition or safety concern, then you would code 88 uh, activity not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern um, if it's a recent onset medical condition. Okay, so now getting into the individual walking items. The first one, as I mentioned, is walking 10 feet. So this assessment would start with the person in a standing position because we've already assessed the person's ability to get to a standing position in a separate activity. Uh, so once in a standing position, the ability to walk at least 10 feet in a room, corridor, or similar space um, I will note that there is a skip pattern here, and basically the reason for the skip pattern here is that if uh, the uh, resident is not able to walk 10 feet, uh, they wouldn't be able to walk the 50 feet or 150 feet, and so uh, you're able to skip over those items that uh, wouldn't uh, make sense to assess for this individual. So again, you know, you're skipping based on the activity not attempted codes. So as a reminder, Manisha did review these with you, but the activity attempted, not attempted codes would be 07, uh, the resident refuses to perform the activity, uh, 9, uh, not applicable, which means that the individual does not perform the activity at the time of assessment and does not, did not uh, complete uh, the activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. Um, 10 would refer to uh, an environmental uh, limitation, and 88, uh, which is the most commonly used activity not attempted code, refers to the activity not being attempted due to a recent onset medical condition or safety concern. Um, we do have you uh, skip, by the way, to the one-step curb, um, and the reason that you could actually have a resident perform one-step uh, curb is that somebody can go up and down a curb or a step in a wheelchair, so somebody may not be able to walk 10 feet, but they would actually be able to go up and down one step. Um, so I think I've covered that on the slide. 
Um, just another coding tip, uh, use of assistive devices and adaptive equipment, for instance, a cane required to complete a walking activity would not affect the coding of the activity. You would code based on whatever um, equipment that, or devices the person normally used, uh, but the use of the device does not increase or decrease the score. So we have another scenario here. Um, we have walking 10 feet. Mr. S. Had, um, had an open reduction internal fixation on his left leg after a fall and is non-weight bearing on his left lower extremity. Mr. S. walks 10 feet in the parallel bars with the physical therapist providing more than half of the effort to support his trunk. So uh, as you think about this, we did talk about parallel bars. That's very important. So I will move on to let you... Um, do the Slido, and the options that you have are that he can be coded one, dependent, two, substantial maximal assistance, code three, partial moderate assistance, or code 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns. Looks like most people are getting their responses in. I'll give you another couple of seconds. Okay, so as I mentioned before, the um, parallel bars are um, not portable, and so um, somebody would not be able to walk up and down the hall, even for a short distance, if they're limited to using parallel bars in therapy. Okay, I see a bit of movement on that O2 code. All right, so moving on, uh, let's see what the correct response is. So as many of you indicated correctly, the correct code is 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. And the rationale, uh, again, the portable um, portability issue is that parallel bars, an assessment that occurs in parallel bars does not count. Uh, we would uh, need to have the person walk with a device that's portable. Okay, moving on to the next item, which is walk 50 feet with two turns. Um, again, as with all the walking items, the activity begins once the person is in a standing position and the person needs to be able to walk at least 50 feet and make two turns. One of the important things about all of the walking items is that the person needs to walk the entire distance. And so the rationale there being uh, in order to determine who performs more than half the effort or less than half of the effort, who's doing what part of the effort, the activity has to be completed. And so for things like dressing or oral hygiene, you know, if, if the, the resident doesn't perform part of that activity, the helper is going to complete the rest of the activity. With the walking items, if a person can only walk, let's say, 25 feet, the helper can't walk the rest of the distance for the person. And so basically the person uh, is coded only if they complete the activity of walking the entire distance. So I, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so basically if, you know, just, you know, going back to the walking 10 feet activity, if somebody walked seven feet, five feet, but not 10 feet, you would say the activity didn't occur. For the walking 50 feet with two turns, if somebody can't walk 50 feet uh, with the two turns, let's say they only walk 20 feet, and maybe they did two turns, but they only went 20 feet, you'd say the activity didn't occur, and you would decide if it's an 88 or an 09 um, based on other circumstances. Okay, so uh, we've had questions in the past about what is a turn. So a turn are 90 degree turns, and it could be two turns in the same direction, so two turns to the right or two turns to the left. It could be two turns in different directions, so one to the left, one to the right, um, or it could be, um, you know, any combination. Uh, the 90 degree turn should occur at the person's level of ability and can include use of an assistive device, for example, a cane, without affecting or increasing or lowering the score. So we do have an example. Um, Mr. R has a chronic neurologic condition resulting in poor balance. He has used a walker for many years. Mr. R ambulates 50 feet with two turns, requiring contact guard as he turns. So again, 
helper is needed in this instance. So then the question would be, is it only setup assistance? If it's more than that, then you would say at uh, the next level of the decision tree, is it uh, just supervision uh, or contact guard, studying touching assistance, or is it more? If that's where you stop in the decision tree, then you have your response there. So let's see what you think about Mr. R. Um, so the response options are code five, set up cleanup assistance, code four, supervision or touching assistance, code three, partial moderate assistance, or code nine, not applicable. Okay, it looks like many of you have responded, but there's still quite a few responses coming in, so I'll give you another couple of seconds. Okay, it looks like most people are coding level four, so let's see what the correct response is. And indeed, level four is the correct response. Um, the rationale being that contact guard assistance being provided during this activity um, would be 04. Um, just in terms of the coding level four, a person, uh, a helper may be present for part of the activity or providing contact guard during part of the activity or during the entire activity. It doesn't differentiate level four, whether it's intermittent or during the entire activity. So one of the next um, items related to walking is walking 150 feet. This is the longest distance. Um, for this activity, again, the person is gonna start in a standing position, and this refers to the ability to walk 50 feet in a, 150 feet in a corridor or similar space. For practice scenario 19, we have Mrs. T, and she walks with her walker 150 feet independently as long as she takes a very brief uh, standing rest break halfway through the walk. So we did talk about breathers previously. Um, so how would you code uh, Mrs. T walking 150 feet? She does that independently, but she does need to take a bit of a, a brief break while she's walking. I will let you put in your responses for Slido. Whoops. I will let you put in your responses for Slido, and um, the options are 06, independent, 05, set up cleanup assistance, 04, supervision or touching assistance, 09, not applicable. So I'll just give you a moment to put in the responses. Okay, it looks like it's slowing down a little bit. So it looks like um, most people are coding independent, and I would agree with that. And indeed, uh, the correct response is independent. So as I mentioned before, um, a brief standing rest break is acceptable. You'd be using your clinical judgment to determine what length of time is acceptable. Um, so you that would be, you know, for each uh, resident, you'd be making an individual assessment about whether it's a very brief break. But uh, certainly if somebody sits down, we would say they did not accomplish 150 feet if they need to sit in between uh, walking that distance. Okay, so the next activity is walking 10 feet on uneven surfaces. Um, this refers to the ability to walk uh, 10 feet on uneven or sloping surfaces. It could be indoor or outdoor. I know some facilities have set up little obstacle courses, that's fine. Or sometimes uh, taking somebody outside onto grass or gravel is certainly acceptable. Turf or gravel are, are fine. So here in uh, practice scenario 20, we have Mr. B. He sustained an incomplete spinal cord injury after a car accident. He ambulates outside on grass and negotiates the turf with the therapist providing more than half of the effort to support his trunk. 
So if you were thinking through the decision tree, um, of course a helper is required here. In this case, it's a therapist. And then you would think through, is it more than touching assistant? Is it more than setup assistance? Yes, is it more than touching assistance? And then is the helper providing less than half of the effort or more than half of the effort would help you differentiate uh, three versus two. And then of course, level one, if they, um, helper is doing all of the effort, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. So I will let you go to Slido and put in your response for what you think is the correct response for Mr. B here. So options are five, uh, set up cleanup assistance, four, supervision or touching assistance, three, partial or moderate assistance, and O2, substantial maximal assistance. Okay, so I'll let, give you just a few seconds to get those responses in. Okay, so when you're coding, you know, the uh, resident doing more than half of the effort would be a three. The helper doing more than half of the effort is level two, so you do have to pay attention to who's providing more than half of the effort. Okay, let's see what the correct response is. Um, looks like most people coded two, and I do agree that is the correct response. Um, so the rationale here is that the therapist provided um, more than half of the effort, therefore the patient provided less than half of the effort, and so that's why it's a level two. Okay, so next uh, we'll move to the steps item, stairs items, and also the pick up object activity. Um, so the first um, activity is one step or a curb, and this refers to the ability to go up and down a curb and or one step. Um, as with the walking item, uh, 10 feet, uh, we have several uh, activities here related to stairs with an increasing number of steps. So if a resident is not able to go up one step or a curb, um, we uh, think that they will not be able to go up and down four or 12 steps. So there is a skip pattern incorporated into um, the section in order to reduce burden. So um, if somebody is, um, being coded on this activity, it is basically the ability to go up and down a curb and or step. It could be with a div, um, the railings or without railings. If it's a curb, um, you wouldn't usually have railings, but if it's a step, it could be with or without railings. If somebody um, can't go up and down a curb, you can certainly assess them going up and down one step with uh, a railing to see if they can do that, and then if the resident is able to do that, then you would be able to move on to being able to assess the, the uh, four steps. So again, same as the walking activity of 10 feet um, for this particular activity, the skip pattern applies to code seven, which is resident refusal, 09, uh, not applicable, 10, uh, not attempted uh, due to environmental uh, limitation, or 88 not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. So here we have um, Mrs. Z, and she experienced a stroke, and she must be able to step up and down one step to enter and exit her home. The physical therapist provides standby assistance as she uses her quad cane to support her balance as she is stepping up one step. The th physical therapist provides steadying assistance as Mrs. Z uses her cane for balance and steps down one step. So the assessment uh, in this case inclu includes her, uh, Mrs. Z's ability to go up the one step and there's um, uh, steadying assistance being provided Stand, uh, sorry, standby assistance being provided as she goes up the steps, up the one step, and then going down, she requires uh, steadying assistance. So as you think about uh, Mrs. Z, how would you code her? So if you can pull over, pull up Slido, um, options to code her are four, supervision or touching assistance, three, partial moderate assistance, two, substantial maximal assistance, and level one, dependent.
She's doing quite well, so I'm glad to see nobody's coding one. Um, let's see, it looks like there's still some responses coming in. Okay. All right, so uh, let's see what the correct response is. And it looks like most of you were correct, code for supervision or touching assistance. So on the way going up, she needed a little bit less help. It was standby assistance. Going down the steps, she got um, uh, studying assistance. Both are actually coded at the same level anyway. And so uh, she gets coded a level four. Next, we move on to four steps. So this refers to the ability to go up and down four steps with or without railing. Um, similar to the skip pattern for the one step, there's a similar skip pattern. If somebody isn't able to go up and down four steps, we assume they're not able to go up and down uh, 12 steps. So that's why there's a skip pattern over that next activity. So again, the um, skip pattern relates to o the code 7, 9, 10, and 88. Those are the four activity not attempted codes. So here, the example, um, we have Mr. F. He's recovering from lo multiple lower extremity fractures and wears a walking boot and uses a quad cane. Mr. F slowly ascends the stairs, grasping the ra stair railing with one hand and the quad cane in his other hand. The therapist provides intermittent steadying assistance as he climbs up the steps. He then turns around and requires steadying assistance throughout the activity as he goes down four steps. So um, again, while he's going up the steps, it's intermittent steadying assistance. As he goes down the steps, it's uh, steadying assistance throughout the activity. I will let you pull out Slido and uh, please code where you think he should B. Level five um, would be coded if you think he requires setup cleanup assistance. Level four if he requires supervision or touching assistance. Level three would be coded for partial moderate assistance. And two would be coded for substantial or maximal assistance. Okay, it looks like there's still some responses coming in. I will give you a moment to get those responses in. Okay, looks like most people have coded level four and I do agree with that response. Let's see what the correct answer is. Indeed, level four. Um, and the rationale, um, again, uh, he requires steadying assistance intermittently to go up the stairs and steadying assistance throughout uh, the activity on the way down. Um, if steadying assistance is intermittent or throughout the activities, it would still be coded level four either way. Uh, he does not require uh, weight bearing or any kind of lifting assistance, and so that's why it's coded a four rather than a three. So basically at level four, uh, we have steadying, touching, um, assistance, but not lifting assistance. Once you get into lifting assistance, it's a level three or below. Okay, the last stair items is 12 steps. Here it's obviously the ability to go up and down 12 steps and it can be with or without a rail. Um, of course, if somebody uses assistive device, that can also be used. Um, so Mr. Y is recovering from a stroke resulting in motor uh, issues and poor endurance. Mr. Y's home has 12 steps with a railing and she needs uh, to use these stairs to enter and exit her home. So obviously the physical therapist is keeping that in mind. Um, so her therapist uses a gate belt around her trunk and supports her providing less than half of the effort as Miss Y ascends and then descends the 12 steps. So um, again, uh, go ahead and pull out Slido as you're thinking about coding. Um, the physical therapist, so in this case the helper, has a gate belt so it does sound like there's lifting assistance going on, and then it's clarified in here that the, um, uh, the therapist is providing support, um, but less than half of the effort as the uh, resident ascends and descends the 12 steps. 
So the options for coding are um, if you can get to Slido, 05, setup or cleanup assistance, four, supervision or touching assistance, three, partial or moderate assistance, and two, uh, substantial maximal assistance. Okay, it looks like there's still responses coming in here. Okay, it looks like it's slowing down now. So it looks like uh, most of you coded uh, three partial moderate assistance. I agree with that. Let's see what the correct response is. It is indeed uh, code three. So again, at level four, there's touching, steadying assistance being provided. At level three, um, there's some lifting that's starting to happen with the mobility activities. So the rationale here, uh, the helper provides less than half of the effort uh, in providing support uh, as Ms. Y ascends and descends the 12 steps. Um, this ac next activity is pick up object. Um, this refers to the ability to bend stoop from standing position to pick up a small object such as a spoon from the floor. So here we have um, scenario 24. Ms. C has recently undergone a hip replacement. When she drops items, she uses a long-handled sponge, or long-handled reacher that she, sorry, wrong, wrong uh, activity. Uh, long-handled reacher that she has been using at home prior to admission. She is ready uh, for discharge and can now ambulate with the walker without assistance. When she drops objects from the basket of her walker, she requires a certified nursing assistance to locate her long-handled reacher and bring it to her in order for her to use it. Certified nursing assistant leaves the reacher with Mrs. C so that she has it handy for when it is needed next. She does not need assistance to pick up the object after the helper brings her the reacher. So basically in this instance, um, in this assessment um, being conducted, uh, the resident does not have the needed equipment with her and so somebody does have to go and get that equipment. And then it looks like the helper uh, leaves so that the uh, resident can perform the activity without somebody needing to be there during the activity. So if you pull out Slido, I will let you code that example. So you would code either six, independent, five, setup or cleanup assistance, four, supervision or touching assistance, and, or three, partial moderate assistance. Okay, so there's still some responses coming in here. Okay, looks like it's slowing down a little bit now. All right, so we will go to the answer. It looks like most people coded five, and I agree, uh, level five. It may have been a little bit confusing that um, it said in the scenario that the um, resident was going to keep the reacher with her, and so maybe the next day the person could have been coded independent, but for what was observed on that day, you code what actually happens, and so in the scenario, she was actually needing somebody to go and get the um, reacher for her, and so that's why it was coded level five. So let's go to the rationale. Um, so again, level five, the helper provides setup assistance so that Ms. C can use her long-handled reacher. Okay, moving on to the wheelchair items. Um, so the first uh, item is actually just a gateway question to see if it's appropriate to code the wheelchair items. Um, so this question basically asks, does a resident use a wheelchair and or scooter? If the answer is no, then you would actually skip uh, the rest of the wheelchair activity items because it's not relevant for that individual. If you uh, indicate yes, the resident does use the wheelchair or scooter, uh, then you would be uh, following up with the remaining uh, items in the section GG0170. 
So in answering this question, um, there are some coding tips for you to consider. So basically the intent of the wheelchair mobility items is to assess the ability of residents who are learning how to self-mobilize during a, uh, using a wheelchair or who have used a wheelchair prior to admission. Use clinical judgment to determine whether a resident's use of the wheelchair is for self-mobilization as a result of the resident's medical condition or um, some kind of safety concern related to uh, balance, or it is just used for staff convenience. If the resident walks and is not learning how to mobilize in a wheelchair, and the um, wheelchair is only used for transport, uh, let's say the therapy gym is on another floor, and so somebody is just being transported between locations, but the individual um, is learning to walk or to um, have better balance while walking. And the staff basically, it's just staff convenience that the wheelchair is being used. You would actually code the gateway item zero. No, the person doesn't use a wheelchair if it's only used for transport and staff convenience. So if the person does actually use a wheelchair and this is what they're going to be discharged using the wheelchair and perhaps they're learning how to use the wheelchair in therapy, um, using wheelchair skills training, um, then you would be moving on to coding the wheelchair uh, items. There's actually two distances, the first one being wheeling 50 feet with two turns. Uh, so this is defined as uh, once the person is seated in the wheelchair or scooter, the ability to wheel at least 50 feet and make two turns. Again, um, as with the walking items, uh, the two turns are defined as 90 degree turns. The two turns may be in the same direction, two turns to the left or two turns to the right, or it could be the turns are made one to the left and one to the right. The 90 degree turns should occur at the person's ability level. So we do have another practice scenario here. Um, in this instance, uh, we have Ms. R. So once seated in the manual wheelchair, Ms. R wheels about 10 feet, then asks the certified nursing assistants to push the wheelchair the additional 40 feet into her room and her bathroom. So in this instance, um, remember when I talked about walking, if the person isn't walking the full distance, a helper doesn't complete the activity. But for wheelchair mobility, a helper can complete the activity. And in fact, this is this example. The um, resident, Ms. R, is able to go 10 feet, but for whatever reason, maybe she has poor endurance, uh, she's not able to go further. And so the helper actually goes the remaining distance, and it does reference turning into a well, it says she goes into a room, that's actually a turn, and then a, a bathroom turn is another turn. So the activity was indeed completed in this instance. It was 50 feet that was traveled in the wheelchair, and the uh, two turns occurred. And so at this point then, uh, in order to code the activity, you have to think about whether um, the um, resident has completed uh, more than half the effort, less than half of the effort. Okay, so let's walk through uh, in terms of coding. Um, options that you have are code four, supervision or touching assistance, code three, partial or moderate assistance, code two, substantial maximal assistance, or code one, dependent. Okay, just give everybody a few more seconds. Okay, still a few more responses coming in. Okay, looks like um, most of you coded uh, two substantial maximal assistance, so let's see what the correct response is, and you are correct uh, too. So um, the rationale here is that the helper provided more than half of the effort, so basically in this instance, the resident went 10 feet, the helper did uh, uh, 
basically the effort for 40 um, feet, and so the helper was doing more than half of the effort. For each of the two wheelchair activities, uh, the person could be using a manual or a motorized um, scooter or wheelchair. Um, therefore, uh, there is a follow-up question asking to indicate the type of wheelchair. So again, it's manual or motorized. It could be a motorized wheelchair or a scooter. Both would be coded too. It is possible that the person uses perhaps a manual wheelchair for shorter distances and a motorized wheelchair for longer distances. So there are follow-up questions for both distances. Okay, so the um, last activity is wheel 150 feet. Once seated in wheelchair or scooter, um, that means the ability to wheel 150 feet in a corridor or similar space. So we have a, our last scenario here. Mr. W is recovering from a stroke and has right-sided weakness that affects his balance and a chronic respiratory condition that affects uh, his walking endurance. By discharge, Mr. W slowly wheels a manual wheelchair 150 feet down the hall without any assistance from a helper. So how would you code Mr. W? The options for Slido are that he could be coded for supervision, touching assistance, seven, um, patient refu resident refused, eight, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern, or six, independent. Okay, it looks like the responses are still coming in. Okay, it looks like it's slowing down. So it looks like most of you coded independent, and I would agree with that. Let's see, the correct response is indeed independent. So uh, he completes the activity, and he did not require any assistance from a helper. Okay, so I did want to um, uh, just wrap back around to the mobility goals. Um, so Manisha covered the goals uh, previously under self-care. So um, as she noted, um, you can uh, use any of the codes for the discharge goals. Um, at least one requ is required for the quality measure related to the process uh, function quality measure related to doing an assessment. I know one of the, um, I'm just gonna pull out my notes here. I know one of the questions that caught my eye that was submitted when Manisha was presenting about self-care goals, um, there was a question about um, if a, a person passes away or a somebody gets transferred out early, how do you code goals? So a goal is required for each stay. So you can code a goal in that instance based on what the expected plan of care was. Um, as I said, for the uh, function process measure, there is a requirement, as Alice articulated this morning, to complete an admission assessment and a uh, a discharge goal for every resident for every stay. And so you can uh, use a predicted or expected plan that was basically when the resident was admitted to the facility. Um, okay. And um, so these are the uh, rest of the mobility items. So obviously you can code any uh, discharge goal, um, including wheelchair activities. Um, so before I go to summary, I, I did want to cover a few of the questions that came in since we do have a bit of time. Um, so there were several questions that came in related to why a cane isn't included in the prior functioning section. Um, and that's because um, when, uh, when we were developing the functional status um, outcome measures, we looked at which devices, which mobility devices that were used prior to the current um, illness, exacerbation, or injury affected the functional outcomes. And the, 
the devices that you see listed on the data set the Manisha covered did affect functional outcomes. And so those are used as risk adjusters for the functional outcome measures. But the cane, we actually did have data from the post-acute care payment reform demonstration. We tested whether use of a cane prior to the current in, um, uh, illness, exacerbation, or injury affected functional outcomes, and it did not. And so um, those items were not, um, that item was not added to the data set as necessary. So I hope that explains a little bit about why that's not included. Um, there was another question, uh, which we actually have gotten on the help desk several times, which relates to stairs. And basically, um, the question was, if somebody, um, if a facility has four steps in their therapy gym and does not have 12 steps for the person to perform and, and be assessed on the activity of 12 steps, can you have the resident go up and down four steps multiple times to complete the, to basically simulate the activity of 12 steps? And the answer is yes. Uh, please use your clinical judgment in terms of simulation of activities, but certainly uh, a resident being able to go up and down um, four steps uh, three times would meet the intent of being able to go up and down 12 steps. Um, another question that I saw uh, had um, a few uh, likes was related to uh, toileting hygiene. Actually, there's a couple of those. So um, one example was um, a resident who had an indwelling catheter and a colostomy. How do you code toileting hygiene in the instance where there's indwelling catheter and a colostomy. So with the indwelling catheter, uh, you wouldn't need to perform toileting hygiene. You don't need basically the, you know, the person's not voiding unless I guess the catheter is leaking, but hopefully not. Um, but you're not managing clothing and doing wiping. So then the um, toileting hygiene would be coded based on the uh, colostomy. And so in the colostomy, basically how that is thought about in terms of toileting hygiene, the emptying of the bag is basically the bowel movement that would happen. And so any cleansing of the end of the bag would be equivalent to the cleansing. And then managing clothing would basically be lifting or, you know, putting the clothing back in place. So just to summarize, in the example where the person has an indwelling catheter and a colostomy, uh, bladder management basically doesn't get covered here because there's no voiding that's happening. The, um, uh, when the colostomy is empty, emptied, the clothing management and wiping related to emptying the colostomy would basically be what you coded on. There was also another ex uh, question related to toileting hygiene, related to um, a person who voids in incontinence briefs. Um, okay, I don't know about bowel movement on this person, but just uh, basically if somebody's incontinent of urine, you can code toileting hygiene. In the example that was provided, uh, the helper provided all of the assistance uh, related to the toileting hygiene activities. So the person, if they voided in their uh, incontinence brief, if the helper is, you know, pulling the clothing up and down, changing, I guess, the uh, incontinence briefs and doing cleansing related to the voiding that happened, that would be toileting hygiene for that individual. Uh, and so that would get coded, probably dependent in that example, if I articulated that correctly. Okay, so I, those were a few of the, the questions that uh, caught our eye. So thank you, Alice and Manisha, for your help in catching those. So in summary, um, in this lesson, you gained knowledge, hopefully, about functional abilities and goals. Uh, you learned about GG intent and item definitions, and you applied the coding instructions uh, through the practice scenarios. And it seemed like you did really well, so I, I hope these were helpful. And uh, we did try and provide some new examples this time so that you're getting some new information. And um, again, we uh, use some coding tips based on questions that you've submitted. So we really do appreciate all the questions that you've submitted either through training or through help desk. It really does help us to articulate some of the coding principles. 
So um, at this point, I will uh, pass it off to Bridget to start to wrap things up for today, I think. So thank you.